So today's book review is um, more than just a book review, but actually sort of a writer's guide uh, little video. How to write a children's picture book. This is volume one, specializing on structure, by Eve Heidi Bienestock. Um, this was recommended to me by Anita Lemon, a children's book writer who I met actually in a flash fiction workshop, which uh, would suggest that Anita has a knack for really tight, concise narrative. Um, it's just about the tightest uh, way to write narrative. Um, poetry, of course, doesn't follow a storyline uh, in the same way that flash fiction would. So I knew that Anita's recommendation of this um, book about structure would be an interesting one to pursue. And it absolutely is. I don't write children's, I write um, full-length fiction and memoir, but, um, and poetry, but it really is um, a nice study. So just to tell you about this, if you're interested in writing children's, what she does here is uses some well-known children's book examples, The Very Hungry Caterpillar, Chicka Chicka Boom Boom, Corduroy, Where the Wild Things Are, The Carrot Seed, Goodnight Gorilla, Sylvester and the Magic Pebble, and many others. She um, first outlines basic story in many examples, and then she goes into more complete detail about how they diverge from classic story structure. Um, lots of writers get into writing because they love a turn of phrase they love um, careful observation of people and nature and um, things that they find they have real talent, unique talent, in writing about. But they don't know uh, intuitively how to structure a story for reader expectation. Um, so this book is an interesting study of that very uh, topic, just about structure. Like I said, it is for children, writing for children, including pictures, picture books, but it's uh, a great lesson to be taken further for novel writing or, or story writing. Um, so, the basic children's book is exactly the same as the basic American full-length novel, which is usually uh, going to start on a three-act structure. Um, by American standards, that would be boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl. If you're in England, it might be boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy marries somebody else and pines away for the rest of his life over the nostalgic moment he shared with that original girl. Or if you're in France, it might be boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy marries other girl but sleeps with 16 additional women while he uh, tries to find himself and becomes prime minister. I don't know. We all have our cultural differences. There are patterns of discourse that are recognized, um, one culture versus another. The U.S. Um, teaches our high school students to start with a very simplistic five-paragraph essay. In that five-paragraph essay, we tell our reader what we're going to teach them or instruct them. We prove it with three major paragraphs, all differing one from another. And then we summarize with a recounting of what we have just proved. Um, internally, each of these three paragraphs will follow essentially the same thing. There will be a uh, introductory sentence explaining what that paragraph is about. There should be three sentences to prove the point. There should be a summary uh, sentence within that paragraph that recounts what that paragraph was about. This is a very simplistic structure that uh, by the time you're a senior in high school, you're probably going to have expanded well beyond that. But it makes sense to understand that as a foundation. Um, that's an American pattern of discourse. The more standard British pattern of discourse runs in a spiral. Uh, it's considered a little too bold and in your face to come right out in England and say, here's what I'm going to prove to you. Boom, 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 therefore I've proved it. Um, the British spiral pattern of discourse hints at, hints at stronger, hints at stronger, hints at a little bit stronger, until you've used at least three or five or seven proof, uh, proof points, and then you can come to your summary statement, which hopefully by then your reader or listener has already gleaned on their own, uh, whereby the British um, writer or speaker can very subtly step back and allow his audience member or uh, reader to understand without being clubbed over the head with the meaning. 
Um, it's just one reason why we have some uh, confusions when we um, listen to one another and find that delivery isn't quite what we expect it to be, even if content is exactly what we expected it to be and understood that clearly. Um, so we're talking really about American structure for novel writing. And, um, and as I said, it's a very basic structure that then, of course, a full-length novel is going to diverge from and fancy up in many different ways. But I think it's important to understand how a three-act structure works, which would then be expanded in most simplistic terms to, say, a five-act structure. Um, Heidi Bienestock says that many of the terms that she thinks are necessary for describing structure um, for children's books don't exist. And she's borrowing from writer's guides for full-length fiction. She's borrowing even more specifically from screenwriter's guides. And, um, the, and she's found terms that uh, I absolutely agree with her choice in using them. And she's come up with a few of her own, which are interesting and um, really useful. So I'm going to tell you a few things that she's done in here. And then I'm going to take it a little step further, too. She, first of all, talks about what she has named the symmetrical picture storybook paradigm. That's just a title for the, um, the style of the structure that she is going to go into detail about. Um, just a plug for this book, which I think is excellent, is that she also talks about salient features of picture books that, um, when I mentioned fancying up that very basic template, she talks about... Uh, how picture books can also teach us about irony, anthropomorphism, pacing, the interplay of text and picture, cause and effect in plot, the difference in emotional response to climactic versus episodic plot, uh, the effect of using the present tense, and the effect of showing character through action. Um, those are all absolutely valuable points in writing any type of fiction. So I think it's worth um, noting that she's... Uh, made a comment on that as well. So then, like I said, the first half of the book is a description in detail of uh, the plot lines of many of these beloved children's books. Um, following that, we get to what I think is very interesting. Um, I'm going to put a link here to a fantastic YouTube video. I think the woman's name is Lori Carol Moore or Mary Carol Moore. Um, about the W structure, as she calls it. This is another way to visualize, graphic organizer, um, a three-act structure. So I'm going to put a link to her YouTube video because it's great. But I'm going to show you, very briefly, if I can make it get in front of the webcam, um, what you will see here from this particular book is um, almost an exact replica of something that Larry Brooks does in his book called Story Engineering um, and Susan Taylor Chihek does in her class on um, story structure. Um, basically they've divided the book, the full structure of the book, into a map whereby there are four equal parts. Um, Act 1 is the first 25 percent, uh, and apparently in children's books it's 20 percent, but usually 25 percent. Um, Act two is actually made up of the middle half of the structure, and then act three is essentially the final 25%. So it's broken down into 25, 25, 25, 25. Um, each act is, uh, goes through a transition, which is a plot turn or a plot twist. Um, there can be subtle plot twists within an act, known as a pinch point, where, where a character is facing something difficult as if they're pinched, but that isn't a major plot turn, and so therefore it's not a change of act. Um, the midpoint of the novel is usually dead center, and that would be in the middle of Act 2, where there's a major reversal in uh, story, story momentum. Um, Heidi Bienestock refers to the major points on that plot line as anchors, and that made me think of another metaphor that I find kind of useful, because I have a hard time... Um, moving a plot in my mind to a graphic organizer, which is flat on the page. A plot, of course, is momentum of um, story over time, characters behaving one way and then another way, and different things happen in the action. 
Well, that is more similar to music in the way pacing and momentum builds. Uh, tension is increased, tension is released uh, by various mechanisms, humor for one. Um, so then when you're asked to sort of yank yourself up 10,000 feet in the air or 30,000 feet in the air, you'll hear different um, descriptions of how best to look down on an entire plot line. I have a hard time doing that. So whatever creates a graphic organizer for me that works is great. And um, Heidi Bienestock talks about the turning points, the major turning points, as anchors. And it occurred to me there's another place where we hear of anchors um, in a major map that we might see, and it's the good old American Mall. Um, I worked in the Brea Mall for a while in a really cute little boutique shop that sold all kinds of crazy Yadro figurines and stuff. We had Nordstrom on one end of the mall. Um, there is a J.C. Penney on another end of the mall. There is a Macy's divided into two components. It's probably men's in one part and women's in another. And there was, I think it's actually a five anchor mall. So it's the two Macy's, it's the Pennies, it's the Nordstrom, and oh, and the Sears. So that's what it is today. Within that, those are, those are the anchor points in the mall. So let's put my hand up here. We've got the major ones. Then you've got all of your boutique stores, your um, American Eagle and the Spencer's Gifts and all the stuff that you kind of expect to see that are going to be everywhere. Sephora's in there, you know, all the mall stores that every major city in America has. Then there will be a wild card or two of little boutique local stores that still exist despite all the odds, which is awesome that they're there. Um, and then there's usually a restaurant or two or even a food court, which I would call your subplot. Um, it's necessary. You sometimes need a diversion from all of your shopping. So the food court is there to take care of those needs. But the basic things are going to be what really drive the business. People are going to the mall because they need to go to Nordstrom, but then they can stop in at that crazy pet store and pick up their fish food and whatever else they, you know, are looking for. So graphically in my mind, I can picture the mall. How to apply it to a book? Well, if you use Heidi Bienestock's suggestion for anchoring your story, she says, start with your beginning, go straight to your ending. Who's, who's got the problem? Who's facing the inciting incident? And how will it resolve? You've got your beginning, you've got your ending, and then you are working towards the middle. The goal when you're writing a children's book, of course, you're not going to waste any time um, getting to your point. But with a novel, one of the classic problems that most novelists have is what they call the saggy middle. Um, you've got your beginning, you probably know where you want it to go in the end, but many people start writing, planning to discover the end as they go. Um, and the middle, because they haven't figured it out yet, begins to sag more and more and more. So if you can start with not a full outline, um, I don't think that's necessary, and I think in, in ways is, is um, I don't know, it sells your writing short if you come in with too strong an outline to start, especially if you're a literary writer. But if you come in with um, a fairly clear idea of what your beginning is and what your end is, then you can plot your anchor points or turning points or pinch, pinch points, midpoint, etc., in order to write the full thing. Um, so this is uh, a bit of a long one today, but I think it's an interesting um, and sometimes important thing to do to look at how beginning, middle, and end really ought to play out and make a story that people um, find meets their expectation and hopefully thwarts convention in some interesting ways to maintain their interest and really capture their their imagination at the same time. Thanks for watching. Hope this helped.